In our discussion tonight, we will examine the Prophet's letter to Kesra, an Arabic, the ruler of the Persian Empire is called Kesra, and in Persian he's called Khusro Perviz. He was basically the second ruler um, when you look at the Sasanian kings and empire, he's the second ruler. He came after the famous Anushirwan. So he's the second ruler who ascended the throne some 32 years before the migration of the Prophet At one time, the Persian Empire was so powerful, it penetrated all the way into Asia Minor. And the influence of it extended all the way to Constantinople, to the proximity of Con Constantinople. So it was really a powerful civilization. But later, the Persian Empire collapsed. And one of the major reasons why it collapsed is the wrong policies of its ruler, the pride that he had, the lavish lifestyle that he had. And so the conquered territories that Iran had basically went out of control. And one after the other, the enemy started to advance until they dealt a severe blow to the Persian civilization. Now, in one of those incidents, Khusro Perviz, the Kesra, he was forced to flee because he feared the Romans. The Romans made an attack, they made an advance, and basically he fled. Now this was considered a very shameful act and this caused his nation to be very angry with him to the point that at the end his own son Shiraway killed him. So this was the end of Kesra. So the Prophet ﷺ sends a letter to this Persian emperor. Let's examine the text of the letter. The Prophet ﷺ opens the letter by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. Min Muhammad rasulillah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Ila kesra azimi faris This is from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah to kesra the great man of Persia Salamun ala man ittaba' al-huda Peace be upon those who follow the path of guidance. وَآمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ And those who have belief in Allah and the Messenger of Allah. And the one who bears witness that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad is the servant and the Messenger of Allah. The text of the letter is similar to the one that the Prophet sent to Caesar. He tells him, I call you to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am the messenger of Allah to all people. I am here to warn everyone. Aslim Taslim. Submit to Allah, you will be safe. In dunya and specifically on the day of judgment. Fa'in abayta. If you refuse, fa'alayka ithmul majus. Most people in Persia at the time, they were majus, Zoroastrians. So he says, if you don't accept my message, the sin of the Majus will be on you because you will be the one who's blocking them from accepting the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now different versions have been recorded but this is the gist of the letter that the Prophet sallallahu sent to Kesra. One version adds an interesting detail. In that version the Prophet says, فَإِنِّي أَحْمَدُ إِلَيْكَ Allah. I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ And then he mentions the following وَهُوَ الَّذِي آوَانِي وَكُنْتُ يَتِيمًا Allah is the one who gave me refuge when I was an orphan. It seems that the Prophet ﷺ is telling him, look at the sign. I'm not a king. I'm not an emperor who comes from royalty and power. I was an orphan. Allah is the one who gave me refuge. Look at this miracle how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has supported me. So basically submit to the path of Allah. وَأَغْنَانِي وَكُنْتُ عَائِلًا Allah has made me sufficient. He's enriched me when I was poor. The Prophet came from a very poor background. وَهَدَانِي وَكُنْتُ ضَالًا And he's the one who gave me guidance. It comes from him. وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى 
ووجدك عائلا فأغنى That means Allah is the one who has given me guidance. Without Allah's guidance, I would have deviated. I am on the right path because Allah is the one who gave me that guidance. And so I invite you to this guidance. Some reports also indicate that the Prophet ﷺ cited this verse that he also cited to Caesar. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ O people of the book, I invite you to one common word between us. We have similarities. Let's believe in the one Lord. Now, according to these reports, why would the Prophet ﷺ cite this verse about Ahlul Kitab when Kesra and his people were Majus, were Zoroastrians? Why would the Prophet use this verse? Now to Caesar, Heraclius, it's clear because, you know, he was Christian. But why did he cite this verse when he was writing to Kesra? Any, any ideas, any thoughts? But it seems like he's hinting he is from Ahlul Kitab because he's using this verse with him. So are the Majus Kitabis or no? There's a discussion amongst our ulama about that. Many scholars believe the Majus had a divine book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them a prophet. He came with a divine book, but then either later they lost it or some reports indicate they burned their divine, their divine book. So if these reports are accurate and the Prophet used this verse, this confirms that they were from Ahlul Kitab. Allah did send them a divine scripture, but unfortunately they lost it or they destroyed it. Let's now discuss some observations about this letter. Notice that the Prophet does not tell him in the opening of the letter, Malik Faris, the king of Persia. He tells him Azim Faris, the great man of Persia. Why is that? One possibility is that Kesra was not a rightful king. So the Prophet ﷺ does not want to approve his kingship. He does not want to give him credit that you are a king. So he says, Azim Faris, yes, you're a powerful great man great politically, right, in Faris. So he avoids using this word. The Prophet was very careful in his letter. He does not want to give him any legitimacy that you are the rightful king of Persia because he was not a good king. Imam Hassan alayhi salam did a similar thing with Muawiyah at the treaty, the sulh that he did with Muawiyah. The Imam does not say, I give you the Khilafah, I give you the Imamah, he does not mention that. All he says is that I'm giving you the Amr. Sallamtu kal Amr. What does Amr mean? Literally it means the matter, the affair. It means this rulership, this political rulership. The Imam does not say I've given you the Khilafah. Because he's not qualified to be the Khalifa of the Prophet He does not say, I give you the Imam. He's not qualified to be the Imam. So we find Imam al-Hassan salam using the same concept with Muawiyah. Now why do I mention that? Because some Sunnis, when they want to make a case against the Shias, they say, yeah, see, if you believe that Imam al-Hassan is the Khalifa of the Prophet and the Imam appointed by Allah, how can he relinquish his Imamah to Muawiyah? And if you say that Muawiyah is an evil man, an evil ruler, how is it that Imam al-Hassan would give him that position? I myself, I've had conversations with Muslims from other schools of thought and this is one argument that they've, that, that they've made. They say you have to accept one of these two. Either he was not a Khalifa or Imam, or Muawiyah was a good man. Otherwise, how would Imam al Hassan give him that position? The answer, he did not give him that position. It was just a peace treaty to avoid further bloodshed. So the Imam could save the community of believers and he could save the actual religion of Islam. So you will not find 
in any report, salamu alaykum, that Al Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam gives him the khilafah. He just tells him, I give you the amr, this matter, which is this worldly, petty, political position. Nothing more than that. So we find that the Prophet does not tell Kesra that you are a king. He just tells him you're the powerful, great ruler of Persia. Secondly, the Prophet tells him, Ad'uka bid'ayatullah. I'm calling on you to the path of Allah. Which means I'm not asking you to submit to another human being. Because he knows that kings are arrogant. They will not accept that. I'm just asking you to submit to the Lord who created you. I'm asking you to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sends this letter to Kesra. How did Kesra receive the letter from the Prophet The messenger arrives and seeks permission to meet Kesra. Kesra commanded one of his men to take the letter from the messenger of the Prophet and to deliver it to Kesra. The messenger of the Prophet refused. He said, no, I'm instructed by my Prophet to give it personally to you. I have to hand the letter to you, not to give it to someone else. Kesra accepts, he takes the letter and he asks someone to read it for him and to translate it for him. Kesra read the first line and he started to rage. The first line is, مِنْ مُحَمَّدٍ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ كَسْرَىٰ عَظِيمِ فَارِسِ From Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, to Kesra, the powerful, you know, man of Faris. He became very angry. Why did the Prophet start with his name? Why did he not start with my name? So he started yelling and he ripped the letter before even continuing to read the remaining part of its content. Then he arrogantly said, Kesra, يَكْتُبُ إِلَيَّ بِهَذَا وَهُوَ abdi." He writes this to me, putting his name before my name and he's my slave. Allahu Akbar. Look at the arrogance of Kesra. He's saying that the Prophet is his slave. Look at the peak of arrogance over here. Then he kicks out the messenger and the messenger, after being kicked out, he goes to Medina. When Kesra's anger subsided, he ordered his people, his men, go after the messenger. Bring him back, let's see what the letter says. Let me see if I can give a better response. But it was too late. The messenger had already gone to Medina. The messenger arrives in Medina. He informs the Prophet ﷺ of the bad reaction of Kesra. You know what the Prophet did? The Prophet did a dua against him. The Prophet stated, Mazzaqallahu mulka kasra kama mazzaqa kitabi. Just as he ripped my letter, may Allah rip apart his kingdom. This is the Messenger of Allah sending you a letter. You don't have the decency to read it over something so petty like that. You rip it apart. There's no decency in such a king. Some reports, by the way, indicate that when Kesra tore the letter, he sent some dust with the messenger. Trap. He just took some dust. He's like, here, take this to your prophet, insulting the prophet. So the prophet said to his companions, he said that Allah is going to tear apart his kingdom and he sent me dust, you will conquer his land. He sent me a part of the earth, Allah will give his earth to you, O Muslims. This was a prophecy from the Prophet Some reports indicate that later Kesra really regretted what he did. So he tried to send the Prophet, you know, um, a gift. But he coupled the gift with some threats. But most historians disagree with these reports. They're like, we don't have any reliable report that he really regretted that and that he sent the Prophet any gifts. So that's not something that we can accept. Kesra was very evil. His evilness did not stop there. He sent a letter to Badan, who was his gover governor in Yemen. And he told him to go to the Prophet and ask him to repent. Look at the arrogance. He tells his governor in Yemen, 
go to Muhammad and force him to repent. And if he refuses, send me his head. Look at the level of threat from Kisra here. Another report indicates Kisra commanded his governor to send two of his men to meet the Prophet and take the Prophet to Yemen. He had no respect for the power of the Prophet, let alone the religious aspect. The Prophet is now powerful. You think you can just send two men to arrest him and take him to men? Look at his ignorance. So these two men, they enter Medina, they meet the Prophet. The Prophet saw that they had shaved their beards and they had grown their mustaches very long. The Prophet notices that. So he asked them, who command you to do this, to have this type of appearance? They said, Amru Rabbina, it is the command of our Lord, meaning who? Kasra. Kasra, our Lord, astaghfirullah, he is the one who commanded us to this. The Prophet then responds, Lakin Amara Rabbi, your Lord tells you to do that? My Lord has a different command. My Lord commands me to not shave my beard, to let, let it grow, and to trim my mustache. So after the Prophet makes this comment, they tell him that we've been commanded to take you to Kesra's governor. And if you refuse, our power in Yemen is so great, we can destroy you. They threaten the Prophet He does not reply to them. He made them wait until the following day. He told them, I will make my decision tomorrow. Meaning, I'll reply to your threat, whether you want to take me to Yemen or not. That same day or night, revelation comes to the Prophet And Allah informs the Prophet that Allah enabled the son of Kisra to kill him. So the Prophet receives revelation that Kisra got killed. So when the two men came to him the next morning, he said to them, Inna Rabbi qatala rabbakuma laylat kada wa kada. <laughs> My Lord has killed your Lord on such and such night. Mark it in your calendar. So later when you hear the news, you realize it's the same night. And he even told them which hour of the night he got killed. And he told them how he got killed. Sallata alayhi shirawayh faqatala. Allah enabled his own son, shirawayh, to kill him. They became very agitated. They told him, look, this claim of yours that Kasra has been killed is even greater than your claim to prophethood. Know that there are huge consequences for making a claim like that, for saying that about our king. Another report says that the Prophet ﷺ told them, tell your governor who sent you, if you become Muslim, if you embrace the path of Allah, I will appoint you as the governor of Yemen. You can stay as the ruler. I authorize you to continue your rulership. They go back to Yemen. They convey that to the governor of Yemen, Badan. When he hears the words of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Wallah, ma hadha kalamu malik. This is not the style and the approach of a king. He's not someone who's trying to pursue, you know, power. I do think he is truly a prophet. Let's wait and see. Let's say if the news about Kesra is true. Remember, it took days for such news to come from Persia to the Arabian Peninsula all the way south to Yemen. Suddenly, a letter reaches him from Kesra's son, Shirawayh confirming Kesra's killing and Shirawayh tells him the following. He sends a letter to Badan and he tells him, be it known to you that I have killed Khusro Parviz, meaning Kesra. The wrath of the nation prompted me to kill him because he killed the nobles of Persia. He disrespected the elders. And then he tells him, as soon as you receive my letter, obtain the oath of allegiance for me from the people. And until you receive further orders from me, don't be harsh with that man, meaning who? Prophet Muhammad who claims to be a prophet. I know my father issued you, to you harsh orders, don't execute them. Wait until I tell you what to do. 
So the governor of Badan, when he gets the signal from the new Persian king, be gentle with this man, and I'm not on the path of my father, I have different policies, he felt safe to embrace Islam. Badan knew that this was a prophet. The hujjah was completed on him. So officially Badan becomes a Muslim and all the Persians in Yemen under his rulership embrace the religion of Islam. That's one reason why a good chunk of Yemen joined the religion of Islam. And remember the Prophet told him you can stay as a ruler over Yemen. It seems that the Prophet even trusted his leadership. When the Prophet told him if you become Muslim, I will appoint you as the governor of Yemen. That means the Prophet is trusting his leadership. By the way, it's important to note here that when Quraysh heard that Kasra commanded his government, his governor to summon the Prophet and to possibly even kill the Prophet, they became ecstatic. Here is a king who's going to deal with this man. We don't have to fight him anymore. We, don't, we no longer have to deal with him. Now the big, powerful Persian king is at odds with Muhammad. They really re rejoiced. It was a joyful day for Quraysh, but their joy did not last. Quickly, soon after that, they heard that Kasra got killed and Badan became Muslim. <laughs> Subhanallah, that was not an outcome that they had anticipated at all. So this was the letter of the Prophet ﷺ to Kasra. Any questions about the letter of the Prophet to Kasra? Yes. Uh, from a, you know, antagonistic point of view, the question could be asked, you know, why if, if Rasulullah has the ilm al he knows that Kasra will react like this. Why did he send him the letter? Not why did he send him the letter? He, he'll send him the letter, but why not put his name second? That way he doesn't react like that, and at least he reads it. So why did the Prophet put his name first and then Kesra's name second? He could have, you know, turned it around and put Kesra's name first. First of all, even though the Prophet has to be humble, it's not befitting to put the name of a kafir before his name. He's the messenger of Allah and the greatest of Allah's creation. The Prophet has to respect the position Allah has chosen for him. Because his title is what? Rasulullah. It's insulting to Allah to put the name of a kafir before Rasulullah. So we know that the Prophet and the Imams, they were very humble, but sometimes they have to show respect to the position Allah has chosen. So it's not appropriate to put uh, Kesra's name. That's, that's the first response. The second response, the Prophet wants to show how arrogant this man is to show how evil he is. And this was a very good way to expose him. Because everyone realized, you know, how ill-informed his decision was. That's why even his own son had the audacity to kill him. He's like, my dad's crazy. This man is sending him a letter and this is how he reacts. So maybe it was a divine plan to expose Kesra. Number three, Possibly the Prophet knew whether he arranges the name this way or that way, Kesra would reject. He was so arrogant, he definitely would not accept the message of the Prophet anyway. So Kesra just wanted an excuse not to accept the letter. Otherwise, he did not accept the Prophet's invitation. So these are three possibilities. But the first one's really important. The Prophet has to respect his position because it's a position from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, it's normal when you're sending a letter to someone to say that this is me from you. Honestly, what's insulting about that? Is that insulting? Do you find that insulting? That's not insulting. He's not putting him second. He's just saying this is a letter from me. You have to introduce yourself to you. <laughs> that's, that's all it is, right? That's not insulting, but these kings are so arrogant, the slightest arrangements tick them off. Which is unfortunate, yes. Um, in, in Hudaybiyah, Rasulullah accepted and told Imam Ali that something similar will happen to you where the title would be erased or not accepted. Yes. So in, in this case, couldn't he do you know, something like that, like Tawriyah or something like that? 
like See, at Hudaybiyah, that's a very good point. At Hudaybiyah, if the Prophet had not omitted that, there would not have been a peace treaty and it would not have been good for, us, for Islam. So Allah commanded the Prophet, this treaty is a victory for Muslims. Make sure it happens, even if you have to fulfill their request. In this case, Kasra had rejected Islam, regardless of how the Prophet would have worded the letter. So there was no point in rearranging it. Whereas at Hudaybiyah, it made a difference. It allowed Quraysh to at least negotiate with him. So over there, even though you could say, well, you know, why would the Prophet omit that? It's serving a greater purpose. It's supporting Islam. And because it's supporting Islam, the Prophet was authorized to do that. Over here, it would not support Islam for him to do that. So that's another way of looking at it. But yeah, that is a good point. So sometimes you just have to sacrifice for a greater goal. Over here, the greater goal was not achievable because Kesra would not accept anyway.